So we have Derek White joining us from Ascot Resources. Thank you for joining us, Derek. Yeah, Sean, thanks for having me. Sure, no problem. So tell us about the company and your background. So um, the company uh, is a, a junior gold development company. And myself and some of the colleagues that I worked with in a former uh, company uh, came at the end of 2017, early 2018, to try and take the company from more of a exploration company into ultimately a production company. I'm an engineer by training and I've been involved in building and operating a lot of mines in different parts of the world. I was born and raised in Vancouver and we relished the opportunity to build a mine in British Columbia. And over the four years from about 2018 to 2022, um, we've been able to take um, a brownfield site and, and move it very close to becoming Canada's next gold mine. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so that's your background. Tell us about your team and how they're, they're differentiated. Yeah, so you know, uh, our team is a mix of different people, but a lot of them came from the former Quadra FNX, and um, we've been able to uh, get people that come from both the engineering and geology side, as well as from the financial side. And um, a lot of the team really enjoyed working together, and we look for opportunities specifically where someone has built a mine, put a lot of capital into it, and abandoned it for some reason. And um, in this case, the, the company was named Boleden. They had put a lot of money into buying and operating this mine for a while, and they were a copper and nickel company and decided really in 2000 to shut the mine down and put it on care and maintenance. And we saw an opportunity for you know less than the normal amount of capital to restart the mine in a relatively short period and, and try and get it going. Now, that process, no matter where you do it in the world, it takes a long time. Um, but we're well on our way to trying to make that happen. And the team is used to that kind of a structure and working in that kind of area. And then we've also brought other people along the journey in the four years that we've been, or five years that we've been doing this. Um, we've just hired a new general manager who's a mining engineer who is familiar with the area. David, who you've met, um, has joined us. He was an analyst that was covering us who decided he liked our story and he was uh, decided to join the team. Um, we've got a new mill manager, and so we've just been able to get another people that have kind of saw the, the, the progress we've made and wanted to be a part of it. I think that speaks a lot because um, your analysts look at a lot of companies, and they can probably pick and choose a little bit. So the fact that he picked your company to work with probably shows something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's great. And, you know, look, and at the end of the day, um, it's really about trying to work on a common goal, which has some challenges. And there's a lot of challenges in mining. Um, uh, there's capital challenges, there's regulatory challenges, there's technical challenges. And, you know, one person isn't going to solve all those problems. So you need a team of people to try and, you know, bounce those ideas around and try and come up with what's the right piece. And um, as the CEO of the company, you know, I'm there to try and put the challenges out there sometimes or provide clarity, but I'm not there always to solve them. And it's really the strength of the team that will make the company successful or not. Right. No, that definitely makes some sense. So in terms of projects, how many do you have and how many of those were acquired? Because it sounds like you were doing some acquisitions. So in this, in this uh, sit situation, um, Ascot as a whole has uh, three projects, but really one flagship project, which is the Ascot Premier Gold Mine. And this mine was a historical mine that was run actually by the Guggenheim family out of New York. And it was put in place in 1921. And it was the largest gold mine in North America on, and, and in the British Empire for quite a long period of time. And um, that project basically was a single mine at the time. And what we've done is taken a new mill infrastructure that was put in place, I mean relatively new, in the 1990s and refurbished that. And we had two mines that we acquired from Belize, and we added another two, one called the Silver Coin Mine and the other one called the uh, Red Mountain Mine. And this is really a hub and spoke model. In this part of the world, which is on the border of Alaska and British Columbia, it's very mountainous, there's a lot of glaciers, infrastructure costs are really expensive. And so we're trying to use this centralized processing kind of infrastructure to uh, run multiple mine feeds too. Interesting, excellent. So you talked about some of the strengths, it sounds like a great team. Uh, great opportunities, good minds. Uh, talk about some of the weaknesses of the company and how you're addressing them. Well, you know, I think a couple of big things. You know, one of the things is a small uh, company is just access to capital. And um, there's a whole pile of different reasons. And, you know, commodity prices go up and down. But when you're building a mine, you know, usually everything goes one way and that's more expensive. <laughs> and over the last, you know, three years, it's been a pretty tough time because we've gone through COVID. We've had 
really big problems in the supply chain where you know things are just taking a longer and we kind of have a general mentality and I'm not saying everybody but there is a a kind of I don't want to work anymore I'm either retiring or I'm laying low or I just don't like what I'm doing so just attracting just general kind of people to do things has been really challenging and so on top of that um, we uh, had a weather event uh, that happened in uh, November of 2021 when we just kind of started the construction and in the west coast both Seattle and Vancouver we had atmospheric rain like unbelievable amounts of rain and during that period up in this part of the world we got atmospheric snow so we had 16 feet of snow in less than 24 hours wow and that meant that we had to deal with a lot of snow and on top of that we were ordering what's called a clarifier and a thickener which are key parts of our equipment and the ship had major uh, 60 foot waves and basically lost its load so we lost our clarifier and thickener <laughs> so we had to re-engineer that so in a project in construction, one of the things that's really important is keeping your schedule. And if you delay your schedule, it just costs you more money. And unfortunately, some things you can't just control, but it's the indirect costs that really drive the overall project costs. And the combination of inflation and the timing and the weather, that really was a challenge for us because we have to overcome increasingly higher operating or capital costs to basically get the mine in, into production. And we've had some delays. In the end of uh, April uh, 2022, we had a project financer um, who was financing us as a debt lender and they had made a, another investment in another mine and that didn't go so well. And they kind of said, we want to change some of, some of the conditions of our, of our debt facility and those conditions were going to be impossible for us to meet. So we had to also refinance that and we're in that process right now. Now we'd raised enough capital that we were able to con continue on the construction and the mine development but we ultimately have to fill that funding gap and the the general equity market is not in a great place right now with you know the fed raising interest rates every every you know couple of, or once a month and, and just the general market quite nervous about all the world events that are going on there so that hole has to be filled and that's still a really big challenge for us and then just making sure that we comply with you know all the regulations and all the different things that are necessary um, for building a mine those are all big challenges for the company would you say Canada is more, how much, compared to other countries, how difficult it is to the regulations and things like that? So, um, each, in, like for example, compared to the US and Canada, each province and each state kind of has their own different requirements. And um, British Columbia, um, especially because it borders Alaska, um, is very concerned about number one, First Nations, and that's you know, a legitimate concern. And in British Columbia, the First Nations generally do not have settled treaties. So there's still a lot of land claims that are going on. And secondly, because it's a mountainous area and you get a lot of snowfall, they're also very concerned about the impact of water. So, it, you know, will water be polluted? And that water can also go to, into Alaska. So there's just different things in Northern British Columbia that you have to be very, very careful with. Um, and, you know, every, every jurisdiction in the world has different challenges and just as a whole right across the world, you know, mining is considered, quote, a dirty business, that you have a lot of problems. And there's a lot of political views about, which are not really scientifically based about, you know, how bad mining is going to be. But that, and British Columbia is no different in that sense. And, you know, just trying to make sure you work well with the regulators and making sure you meet the requirements that are necessary and the First Nations requirements and just generally society as a whole's requirements to protect the environment. And, to, and, and as a good mining company, we want to do that. I think the balance is trying to do scientifically what's right versus what's a perception and just deciding that it's all bad. I mean, not all the things that mining companies do are bad. In fact, some mining companies do more for the environment than a lot of other companies or a lot of other people in this world. So you always have to try and strike that balance. Interesting. I mean, yeah, if it weren't for that resource, a lot of these people wouldn't be having phones, right? You know? And so yeah, I mean, look, and, you know, I mean, it, what's <laughs> tricky is if I said to a lot of people that were, you know, very anti-mining, well, would you not like to have a cell phone, no computer, <laughs> no fridge, no heating, yeah. uh, no car, you know, and they it's just... It's not a luxury just, item to have gold yeah, and, 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 and so it's just, you know, it's tricky because at the end of the day, you might be saying, well, I, you know, I could live without those things, but the majority of society wouldn't live without those things. Correct, and yeah. they have to come from somewhere, whether you're mining them in your own country or you're mining them in some third world country where there is no environmental regulation. So again, it's having the right balance. And as general in society, we need these things. You know, I, I think if I took everybody, like I have three children, if I took their cell phones away and said, you can have a cell phone anymore, there would be a revolt. Yeah, so, you know, say dad, I, go mining. Yeah. <laughs> 
Interesting. Well, it sounds like you've weathered the storm pretty well in a lot of ways. And you're, um, how many years did you say you guys have been in business? Well, for the, for the Ascot project, the, the, the company's been around probably since the 1990s, but the yeah. team that's involved right now has really been involved since 2018. So, you know, we've been working on, on, we have three projects outside. We have two other ones outside the gold mine. We have a large copper deposit that's owned in Washington state. And then we have a gravel mine that is not, it's shut down right now that sits on in the BC coast. But the main focus has been on restarting the premier gold mine. Interesting. All right, let's shift gears and talk about your shareholder mix and what's institutional, private, public. and Sure. So um, as a junior exploration company, when we joined the company, the majority of the shareholders were retail shareholders. Shareholders, and there was a large group based out of Alberta um, who had come into the company a long time ago. And these guys had made a lot of money generally in oil and gas and liked the idea of investing in a gold uh, exploration company. Um, as, you know, as the companies had bigger capital needs, we've started to diversify that shareholder base. And so we've had more institutional shareholders. Um, we have, you know, probably five or six institutional shareholders, mostly based in the U.S. and the U.K., that make up the majority of, of, of the shareholders. And we had, we have one strategic shareholder, which was Umana, who's now just been bought out by Goldfields out of South Africa. Um, and that transaction hasn't quite completed. But, you know, so the mix of the retail um, to the institutional has shifted more to the institutional. And that's pretty normal for companies like us as they go closer towards production. And generally, it's because the, the, the equity raises or the capital that's required to build these things is just larger. It's beyond the capacity of the retail shareholder. Interesting. So then how much, what percentage do you, is the team own and people inside the company? So um, the team uh, basically probably has now, nowadays probably less than 1%. And um, that includes some of the directors. It's probably a little bit over 1%. And um, the... You know, the team came into the company when it already was pretty established, so that was kind of normal. But the, the, most of the senior team has bought stock and, you know, at least, well, many of us equal to more than one year salary of, of money that's been put in. So the team, the team has a fair bit at risk in terms of trying to make this work. And also, you know, the team compared to bigger jobs or bigger companies, we probably aren't compensated in the same way that we're normally, we want this to work and we're trying really hard and working really hard to make that happen. So I don't think there's any lack of motivation or skin in the game, you know, as, as you would say from the team who, who've been working on this really since 2018. Reinvestment is a big sign that you want it to work and for sure that it's, you're in for the long haul. So that's important. What, um, in terms of fixed costs and some variable costs, where do you feel like you guys have an advantage? Well, the biggest advantage we have is in the infrastructure. So the Golden Triangle, which is this area kind of in northwestern British Columbia, it's known to have some of the largest and best gold, silver, and copper deposits probably in the world. And in the last, you know, three or four years, um, it's really changed a little bit because the infrastructure costs are so high, it's really hard to even get off the ground. So there's a lot of junior exploration companies there. Over the past two years, you know, and Newcrest, which is a large Australian company, has stepped in and bought two of the other uh, key operating mines, one called Red Chris and the other one called Bruce Jack. Bruce Jack is about 40 kilometers north of us, and it's the largest gold underground gold mine in Canada. And um, where we have a little bit of an advantage over a lot of people is we're a 25-minute drive from Hyder, Alaska, or Stewart, British Columbia, and we already have a 32 megawatt power plant right beside our mill. We already have a mill. We already have roads. We already have um, a lot of underground access. So it's that infrastructure uh, being in place that really makes the difference for us. I think the other thing is because there's a concentrated world port in Stewart, it's like a big fjord with deep water ports. Um, just having access to Stewart and being close to that is also a major advantage to us because if you're farther away from these areas, um, it just costs you that much more money to have camp or to have um, you know, the build. And so that's probably our biggest opportunity is the fact that we have a very good location, which has been well endowed by historical infrastructure. Excellent. So in terms of inflationary pressures, uh, how are you guys handling that? I mean, so, you know, if you're crazy enough to build a gold mine or any mine at this point in time, you know, you have to face <laughs> what's going on in the world. I would say that when we were a little surprised that we've done pretty well on the direct costs, so they came pretty much close to the estimated costs that we're going to have, where the things that we really haven't been able to control is the indirect cost. 
And the indirect costs are things like food uh, for, or, or fuel or shipping or the time for logistics. Um, those are things, uh, and sometimes parts, because you, you have all these men waiting, or men and women, really, to, that are waiting to install stuff, and if it doesn't come, you're still paying them, yeah. and you don't get any productivity. And so those are things that are a little bit outside of our control, and though, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to kind of compress our schedules into very productive periods to try and eliminate as much of that indirect cost. That's really where we've seen inflation be really tough. And... Um, you know, in general, I would say out there, you know, despite whatever, you know, CPI and other things are saying, I would say the real inflation rate's around 10%. And so, you know, you're experiencing 10% inflation right across the board. And I would say that um, I, I don't really understand this exactly because it's the first time in my life I've experienced it. But as we head into potentially a recession, the unemployment rate is still extremely low. And it's not because the economy is doing that well. It's because people just don't want to work as <laughs> yeah, much. Yeah, you're so, off the window in six months. You're not yeah. in unemployment. You're not yeah. even considered. So I don't really know where this goes because I assume people have to work to feed themselves. But for whatever reason, this kind of lay low activity kind of level is out there. And so you have this very weird dynamic where you're seeing food and fuel and a lot of the core things that drive our life go up a lot. But yet, um, you know, basically people still not being willing to work, which is, I've never experienced that before. It is interesting. I think a lot of it is some of the government handouts that are de-incentivizing. No question. And, uh, and, you know, during the COVID period, I think a lot of people had a reassessment of, well, I don't have to go to the office anymore. I can work out in my, in my pajamas. I'm around my kids more. Uh, I, you know, there's just a lot of different things. And so people are making some lifestyle changes. And I, I think that's not just impacting us, it's impacting everybody. Yeah. It's just the way we do work. And I think the other thing is, you know, when companies kind of went through a period where they weren't exactly sure how this was going to go with COVID, people did lay people off or retire people early, and those people aren't coming back. Yes. Yes, exactly. Interesting. So let's talk about kind of the future of, hey, what's your I mean, exit strategy, merger, growth? You know, where do you see... And going in that direction? Well, I think, you know, you have to kind of look in sort of shorter and then medium and then longer term priorities. So in the short term, it's just find the funding and get over all the different things that we need to do and finish building the mine. So that's the number one priority. I think um, what I've experienced in the mining industry is a lot of this is about risk. And so as a single asset, you know, as a single site gold mine, you have more risk than if you have more than one asset. And surprisingly in our industry, in the gold part of it anyways, there hasn't been as much merger activity as I would have expected in these times because some of the bigger companies have more money than they did in the past and the need for diversification is is important. So you have to kind of make the right deal. But I would think that, you know, once the operation is is performing well, you know, looking for opportunities to diversify through acquisition or combinations or whatever, I think is a good thing. As long as there are smart deals and they make sense for the, the larger shareholder groups. I think you basically end up with a better product than you know, less risk because you've got more um, opportunities to create cash flow. And so I do see that you know, as a, a kind of a longer path. And whether we're the successors in that or somebody else, you know, really, you, know, you can't bring that into it. It's just what's best for the shareholders and how do you make that work. Um, and unfortunately, in our industry, there has been a lot of egos where things that should have happened didn't or things that did happen shouldn't. And so you kind of have to make sure you, you look at it pretty coldly and say, okay, is this making more value for the shareholders or not? And I think ultimately that is. But we also have a lot of exploration opportunity in this area. We have a lot of ability to grow once we get into production and, and start generating our own cash flow. And I think that's one of the first places we'll be looking and then trying to see how do we diversify our risk portfolio uh, to make sure that you know we have a, a better kind of value proposition for people. Because in a single mine, things can go wrong. And you don't really have that. You just have that single basket. You have that one egg and that one basket. And you really would like to have two at least to start with. Right. That makes sense. So let's talk about macroeconomics. What uh, everybody's getting the question is when's gold going to have its day? So I think, um, you know, gold is definitely an opportunity as an inflation hedge. I think the big issue is, though, is the gold market is generally sl a small market compared to the U.S. dollar market. And when you have the Ukraine situation, you have the Chinese situation, you have energy prices really going up, you have this weird dynamic, as I talked about earlier, about people laying low and not working, 
you, know, you have some really big macro events that do impact the world. And what I think happens, especially in, when the Fed uh, in, increases the interest rate and ultimately you can get a better yield on Treasury, that is a highly liquid market. And that unfortunately takes a little bit of the shine off gold because it's a much bigger market. So a lot of bigger investors are like, well, you know, yeah, I'm kind of interested in gold, but the, if I can make a 3% you know, or 4% yield on a Treasury bond, and a, and a gold is just a non-bearing interest asset, you know, gold will, will struggle a little bit. And so, you know, I think everybody's waiting for the big run in gold. And I would say that that's still possible. But I think, you know, there's got to be a little more certainty on what's going to happen with the U.S. dollar. Because the problem for the United States is as the interest rate goes up with the amount of debt they have is, you know, that's a big issue. Because you, the taxpayer in the United States will end up paying a lot of money just to pay interest down on the debt. The other issue is that if the U.S. dollar becomes too strong, then it just makes any kind of exports really difficult. And so I do think that will counterbalance itself. And I, you know, if I had a crystal ball and I could tell you exactly what I was doing, <laughs> probably have a new job to do. But you know, I think that um, that will eventually happen. The U.S. dollar won't just keep going up forever, and the Fed won't keep raising interest rates forever. They can't. They're getting. They can do a few more, but we'll, we'll just have to see where it goes. I think that um, then you, you'll start to see gold have more of its day then because people will still be nervous about things. But, you know, I think there will be a kind of a plateau on the treasury bonds. And, you know, I think both silver and gold will probably start to do better. I think other currencies, you know, if gold is cheaper and, you know, they probably privately are doing this, are probably going, gee, I don't know if I just want to back the U.S. dollar. I'm worried, you know, about the general economy. And so they may be slowly starting to accumulate gold and it, they'll do it privately because they obviously want to accumulate at a lower price. So, but eventually that will start to come out. Do you foresee a black swan event or, you know, us needing a gold backed currency? I, I, I do, I, you know, if you just continue quantitative easing, not just the United States, Canada, the United States, Europe, all these different places, just basically printing money forever. You know, it eventually you go, what is the worth of this paper? Because it's not really backed up by anything. And so I do see a need to do that eventually. Like we've gotten away with super cheap capital for the last 10 years and we printed our way out of a lot of problems. And, you know, it's become kind of a crutch for us as, as you know, kind of the developed world. And I don't really see that as sustainable because ultimately if you do not have the GDP growth and you do not have certain things. You can't just keep printing money and assume the money is worth the same. That just doesn't make sense to me personally. And so I do see a requirement eventually to back it up by something. And because gold is a scarce commodity and has been the traditional, you know, kind of um, holder of value, I do see an, 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 a need for it. And I do see that you know, even with the millennials and everybody who runs after Bitcoin and stuff, those <laughs> things just aren't as advanced as gold. And so I do see that eventually happening, whether it's a full on you know, we have to have a gold standard because, you know, I think one of the other things, and I'll just kind of be brief on this, but, you know, the United States dollar is the world reserve currency for good reason. And the Chinese renminbi or the European, the euro or whatever, they're just not in a position to be that. But that may not last forever. I and agree. so, you know, you may have to, you may start to see people wanting kind of something to back up effectively currencies because you know central banks have gone around and printed money at just kind of recklessly to some level to get themselves out of problems and if you have a society that says i don't want to work and just keep giving me money and you know eventually that's going to come to an end you can't have that go on forever exactly i believe the same actually um so derek what uh, last comments would or uh, input would you like to give before we wrap up well, you know, I, I think, you know, from the Ascot perspective, like we're really proud of all the things we've done and there has been a lot of challenges and it isn't easy, but it, you know, and that's part of the reason why we're here is, is trying to make something that isn't easy happen. Um, you know, I think that despite all the challenges that we have, I, I'm confident that we're still going to get this done. And when you look at a lot of the developers who are coming into new gold mines, they have much bigger capital numbers. We're, you know, kind of already half pregnant. Like we're we're hmm. close to the finish line. We have a year's kind of work to complete. And you know, I'm I'm confident that we're going to get there. And I think for investors, when you do move from a fairly low stock price into a fairly small capital build, relatively speaking, to get to the that's a good value opportunity. So I would hope that people who watch this really do have a look at it and say, look, 
maybe it's worth putting a little bit of my portfolio into something like that because I've got a reasonable upside with, you know, not, you know, assuming that we can get the financing necessary, you know, not too much risk compared to a, like a greenfield site where you've got a much bigger capital ticket to write in a pretty tough uh, economic time. Okay, well, excellent. Thank you for your time, Derek. You're welcome. Thanks, Sean, for having me. You're welcome.